Society is familiar with the classic image of Isaac Newton, observing an apple fall from a tree and contemplating gravity. This can be considered one of his most famous discoveries. However, the lesser known three laws of motion are perhaps more relevant in relation to sport and biomechanics. Sir Isaac Newton is widely regarded as the most influential scientist of all time. Making major contributions in fields such as mathematics and physics, he was able to immortalise his legacy in the teachings of his theories. Arguably, his most important investigations led to the development of Newton's three laws of motion. Born in 1624, Newton came from a farming background. However, his noticeable intellect at a young age prompted his parents to allow him to escape this profession. He was enrolled in Trinity College, Cambridge at the age of 19 and thus began his highly acclaimed career. Excelling in the fields of mathematics and physics, Newton was made Lucassian Professor of Mathematics, considered among the most prestigious academic positions. Newton received many honours, including the first knighthood conferred for scientific achievement. Isaac Newton died in 1727, thus ending his remarkable existence. During this era, the pursuit of knowledge of the world around us and the laws which govern it were a highly regarded career. Due to this, many breakthroughs were made in all fields of mathematics and science. In particular, the laws of motion were an immense leap forward, connecting previous theories and knowledge to those accepted today. In the early 17th century, Premier scientist Galileo thought about an object's motion and the forces acting on it. The general scientific consensus was that an object in motion slows down due to the lack of a pushing force. Galileo, however, is recognised as the first to think of this deceleration as the contrary. Objects decelerate due to the forces slowing their speed. This led to the proposal of his law of inertia. A body moving on a level surface will continue in the same direction at constant speed unless disturbed. This was later refined by Isaac Newton to become Newton's first law of motion. At the age of 45, Newton published his most defining work. This was the Magnum Opus Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, first published in 1687 in Latin and then later in English. It contains an outline of these laws, their implication in the real world, and many of his calculations relating to planetary orbit. Newton congregated all previous knowledge in addition to his own findings to produce the three laws of motion we now know today. This first example shows a ball at rest. According to the first law of motion, the ball will not move unless a force acts upon it. In this case, the kicking action is that force on the ball. This force is great enough to overcome inertia and set the ball on a course, in the same direction as the force. Here, a car begins at rest, with a tendency to remain at rest. When the driver accelerates, the car moves forward. However, the forces of inertia act on the car and the driver. The back of the car moves down slightly, while the front rises. Additionally, the driver experiences a force pushing him back into his seat. Once inertia is overcome, this force becomes balanced. Now, if a moving car is stopped suddenly, we can expect the opposite outcome. Firstly, the front of the car will lower as the back rises. The driver is thrown forward, held in his seat by the seatbelt. The first law of motion tells us that an object in motion will continue in its state of motion unless acted upon by a force. In this example, the moving object has a tendency to continue moving and the application of the brakes causes the forces to become unbalanced. In golf, the ball is moved by the application of force to the ball. This is also the case for soccer and hockey. Yeah. Newton 
Newton's second law examines the relationship between force, mass and acceleration in motion. The application of force brought upon an object will result in the acceleration of that object. There are four basic forces that act on an object accelerating in flight. It consists of gravity, air resistance, lift and inertia, the major contributor in Newton's first law of motion. Hitting a ball is an example of the second law of motion. When an object is accelerating from contact with a bat, it travels under the combined forces of gravity, air resistance, lift and inertia. The force generated by the bat is greater than any of those individual forces, resulting in the ball moving in the direction that the bat dictates. When hitting the ball with full force, it will accelerate at maximum speed. However, when bunting the ball, it will accelerate at a slower speed, because there is a lower force being applied. In other words, the amount of force being applied from the bat to the ball will determine the acceleration of the ball through the air. Because in Newton's second law of motion, acceleration is proportional to the force causing it. Another example is catching and throwing a ball. If a constant speed is thrown, the greater the mass, the less acceleration of the ball through the air. The smaller the ball thrown, the quicker it will accelerate. When an unbalanced force acts upon an object, the motion of the object changes. Rate of acceleration depends upon two things, mass and force. In this example, the force being applied to the person on a bike is remaining constant, resulting in a smaller mass to accelerate at a greater speed. Larger mass accelerates at a much slower speed. This means if an object gets twice the mass, it accelerates half as much. In other words, force and acceleration are directly proportional while mass and acceleration are inversely proportional. In tennis, the athlete's tennis serve demonstrates how the greater the force he applies, the greater the ball will accelerate. And in a drop shot, where less force is applied, resulting in less acceleration of the ball. This is also the case for cricket, gridiron throw. Here, the bouncing ball represents the third law of motion. As the ball impacts with the ground, it exerts a certain amount of force. The ground exerts the same amount of force back to the ball, and due to this, the ball bounces. The ball in this example forms the action, with the ground acting as the equal and opposite reaction. The larger the push on the ball, the larger the reaction, and therefore, the larger the bounce. A similar example can be observed when an athlete jumps. They exert force downwards onto the ground, and hence are propelled upwards. However, the athlete only becomes airborne if the ground can exert an equal reaction. Therefore, on a softer surface such as sand on a beach volleyball court, the athletes cannot jump as high as on an indoor volleyball court. In running, the athlete pushes off the ground and is forced forwards and upwards. In table tennis, the constant bouncing of the ball is an example of the third law of motion. When a diver jumps on a springboard, they exert downward force. They are then propelled upwards by an equal and opposite reaction. Applying the third law of motion to a soccer trap will improve your ability to control the ball. Controlling the ball properly will increase your time of possession during a game. Understanding how the third law of motion relates to the bounce of a ball can enable you to reduce the ineffective bounce off your foot. Here, the athlete's foot is rigid, thus the impact of the ball on the foot is resulting in an equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, the ball flies off the athlete's foot. To reduce this bounce, the athlete can soften their touch or draw the ball back to slowly minimise its velocity. 
This change in velocity of the ball will provide the athlete with a more effective trap on the ball, allowing the athlete in a game situation to increase their time of possession. Everywhere you look, these balls are being followed by everything around you. With more awareness, you may begin to recognise your own use of these three laws in daily life.